Hi everyone, Teddy Baldessar here. Now in the world of watches, when we're talking about just mechanical watches in general, I think often we maybe overlook the actual movements inside the pieces that we are buying. And that is especially true when it comes to third party movements. There are many people that will go ahead and throw around loosely the idea of in-house calibers, but then when looking in the direction of third party, it's always negative connotations, but I don't think that is always very fair because if you're wanting something that's very reliable and has been proven in the market, Third party movement is a great place to look, but there's just so many of them that it could be very overwhelming. But in this video, what we're gonna be doing is doing a pretty comprehensive overview of the different third party options out there, talk a little bit about each one of them, the different ones that you'll be confronted with, and just when you're looking out for your next piece to have a better understanding of the backstory behind that movement as well as whether or not it's going to be the right one for you. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at the predominant manufacturers when it comes to third party movements, look at the most popular movements that you'll be confronted with from those manufacturers, go through the basic specification of each one. For this video, we're going to only be looking at mechanical movements, so no coarse movements as that would really make this a long one. Also, I'm not going to go into every single detail about every movement as well as all the different variations, but really highlight those key models Model families. And also, if you have some great experience with many of these movements, just leave more comments down below. I think that'd be helpful for people as they're going about making decisions. And then finally, the idea of accuracy is a little bit gray in some areas because at the end of the day, the number one determining factor for accuracy is going to be the company that is gonna actually be casing up the movement, casing up the watch and regulating it in their own facility. But we'll try to provide as many just basic out of the box specifications whenever possible. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at, of course, third party movements, but if you want something with a little bit different flavor, maybe some in-house flavor, there probably isn't a better brand representing this idea than Zenith. Now at teddyballister.com, we are a full authorized dealer of Zenith, very proud authorized dealer of Zenith, because they are probably one of the brands that epitomize the idea of automatic chronograph calibers. And the El Primero, so much so, is commonly associated with the brand more than even a model, which is not something that's typically replicated if you look across the industry and how people maybe visualize brands. On our store, we have quite a bit of variety going for more traditional El Primero calibers and their structures, as well as some pretty crazy stuff with the El Primero 9004 featured in the DeFi 21 El Primero, which has, of course, that double balance inside with the movement, one operating at the traditional high beat frequency at five hertz, and the other one at 50 hertz. So 360,000 vibrations per hour for that movement is going to allow that central chronograph second hand to track one hundredth of a second. So teddyballster.com, full authorized dealer of Zenith watches as well as 30 other brands, check it out. Great way to support the content, quick and fast fulfillment, full factor warranty for all the products that we carry. So if something goes wrong, you're completely covered. And nine out of every $10 that we generate goes right back in this content that we're creating. So to begin here when looking at movements, the probably best place to look to start is going with the more affordable stuff and just working our way up from there. And the place that we wanna look first is looking at Japan with Miyota. Now, starting with one of the biggest movement manufacturers in the world, we have Miyota, which was founded back in 1959 as a movement factory for Citizen Watches. And Miyota today is still a subsidiary of Citizen Watch Group, and since the early 1980s have been selling watch movements to other brands. Now, besides producing literally millions of inexpensive quartz movements for Citizen brands, as well as many others, Miyota is also well known to enthusiasts thanks to affordable automatic calibers that are often included in many micro brand watches or even bigger names like Timex, for example. If you've owned anything on the more affordable side of the watch industry, or perhaps dabbled in the world of micro brands, there's a really good chance you've experienced a Miyota caliber like the ones we're going to be mentioning. Now jumping in with what is without a doubt Miyota's most popular movement, the 8215, which has been around since 1977, and is a caliber well known for its inclusion in thousands of different watches, including many of Timex's inexpensive automatics, certain Bulova models, as well as some Laco entry-level Fliegers as well. Now the 8215 movement itself is affordable when purchased after market, making it no secret why it is so often seen. The movement also offers essentially no finishing across the rotor and bridges, but in some instances will have added hacking. Other common variants of this family are the 821A, which comes with some added decoration, also have gilt versions, or the 8205, which will feature a day-date complication compared to the traditional date. Now typically you'll see the 8215 in watches around the $200 to $700 price range, though there are certainly outliers that exist. Now the 8000 series of movements is certainly a very popular range of movements of many different variations, but as you start getting into that $500 range, what you're gonna start seeing more of 
is the use of 9,000 series movements from Miyota. So these are fairly newer movements. And the main thing that you're gonna notice from an upgrade standpoint is first, the actual beat frequency. So these are gonna be jumping up to four hertz rather than three hertz from the 8,000 series. And then also we'll have some other modifications to it. And one of the unfortunate things about the 9,000 series and just Miyota in general is there's sometimes some baggage associated with their movements because of the really affordable chord stuff that is on the low, low end. And when you're looking at the 9000 series on the paper, as well as uh, what you're seeing in terms of actual wear, they're very good movements for the money and can compete with some very standard decorated and graded uh, ETA or a Swiss stuff that you'll see a little bit later on. Now, just a little bit more about the 9000 series of movements, particularly the 9015. Now, this movement was released in 2009, and again, will beat faster than the 8215. So four hertz versus three hertz will have more joules. It also hacks, is significantly thinner overall, which is going to be a big point and something I'll ask you to keep an eye on as we proceed here and seeing how that will affect many of the watches maybe you're striving for and ask that question, hey, why didn't they make this smaller? Also with this Miyota 9000 series, you'll see an improvement with that deviation rating with the accuracy. The 9000 series is more of a direct competitor in many ways to the more popular ETA or Salita calibers that we'll cover here in a bit. The 9015 is slim enough to fit in many dressier watches and will also have that beat rate to match the popular Swiss counterparts. The other aspect of this family of 9000 series calibers is that they come with a plethora of variations like a no date with the 9039, the gilt versions, as well as a long list of added complications and styles. Now similar to the 8215, the 9000 series can be found in a wide variety of brands and typically are going to be seen starting around that $500 range and up to around $1,000. And again, Miyota sometimes gets an unfortunate bad rap when looking at their quartz movements. But as you get up to these 9000 series, they are very solid movements for the money. All right, so now to transition to another Japanese manufacturer looking at Seiko. And Seiko doesn't prioritize movement manufacturing for third parties the same way as Miyota will but you will see it with their NH35 and 36 as probably being the two most common movements out there on the market from Seiko. And these are being uh, produced and done by Seiko Instruments. And essentially, just so you can understand what's happening here, so you're probably familiar with the 4R family of movements from Seiko, if you are, of course, familiar with Seiko. Commonly found in the Turtles, Samurais, as well as the Cocktail Time families, very solid, just workhorse movements out there for Seiko being used in a variety of different applications. What they're basically doing is changing the naming convention and allowing them to be distributed to other third parties to be used and housed within different micro brands as well as other manufacturers out there on the market. Now these movements, just like the 4R family, are of course very reliable and do a lot of good when looking at the regulation front as well as being very versatile in terms of their uh, housing and casing. A couple important notes here when looking at the specifications of these. So these are three hertz movements. So compared to the 9000 series, not gonna be that four hertz, but instead 21,600 vibrations per hour. So more in line with the Miyota 8215 and the 21A family of calibers there. So the 8000 series also, these movements are rather thick. So what you'll often see these being housed within will be more dive watches. A lot of micro brands utilize these. And why these are often used, just like the Miyota calibers from the 8000 series, are gonna be because of pricing. These typically are well-priced. They could be housed within watches very regularly between say that $300 price range to $750 price range where you commonly will see them. And from a regulation and tolerance standpoint, I've seen really good accuracy ratings out of these, despite the out of the box ratings not being really that great. Uh, typically you'll see these sometimes after regulation from a really respected manufacturer, just a good brand or micro brand, around say the 10 second mark in terms of accuracy, which is quite good for these movements. Also, what I wanna mention is the NE15 or the NE family of movements, which is essentially the same thing was happening with the 4R moving into the NH. Instead here, the equivalent will be the 6R family of movements. Why you don't see them that often, I almost forgot to mention them completely, uh, is just because the prices versus the upgrades that you're gonna be getting, you do get a longer power reserve on these. They are uh, usually have some better tolerances in terms of accuracy. But for those returns, they typically are not gonna be delivering that for the price, as we're talking usually multiples if you're going to go, at, go out and buy one of these in comparison to say an NH35 or a 3.6. But again, in the vast majority of cases, the two movements that you're gonna be seeing from Seiko Instruments will be the NH family with the NH35 and the 3.6 with the 3.5 offering just a date and the 3.6 offering a day date. 
Okay, so now that we've looked at some of the primary Japanese movements, we get into the big players in the Swiss industry and probably the first one, of course, that will come up will be ETA. And I'm gonna try to breeze through these as quick as possible because ETA is going to be the really the standard when it comes to third-party movements from Switzerland. And a lot of the brands to follow here will kind of be following suit with what ETA really paved the way for. Now, one of the rubs when it comes to ETA is going to be their actual production and other brands getting the opportunity to use their movements or even buy their movements. Uh, for a long time, they actually had a, pretty much a monopoly in the marketplace, which created a lot of friction with the Swiss government, uh, many manufacturers out there. And now since there have been other people that have come into the fold and there's a lot of just, just dirty stuff that's kind of went on in this area and a lot of back and forth in the industry regarding their actual supply and production and who they could sell to, how much could they sell to. So I don't want to get into too much of those details, but Etta really is the king in this arena in terms of paving the way here. And also another point of distinction here as we go through these Etta calibers, also Salida and STP to follow, is there's different grades for these movements, which are going to be important for a couple of reasons. One, of course, it's going to change the components that are used, also will change the finishing on these movements, and most importantly, will change the actual tolerances and accuracy for these movements as well, as some of them are gonna actually be sent in for cost certification. So you have your standard grades, your labores, then you have your tops, and then you have those chronometer grades as well. So those four grades, and this is gonna be the case for some of these movements that we're gonna be looking at here. Now, just to start going through some of these, starting with some manual calibers from ETA. So we have the Pazoo or the ETA 7001. So when ETA absorbed Pazoo, they kept the brands well like 7001 caliber completely intact. Now in terms of dependability, the 7001 has been humming away in watches since its release in 1971. And it's still a great choice for any watch where movement thickness is an issue considering it's felt 2.5 millimeter height, as well as being a very well finished movement for the money. Now this non-hacking hand winder can be found in watches from Tissot, Junghans, Omega, and pre-in-house Nomos who actually base their alpha caliber on the 7001. Other benefits of this movement is that it's going to be nicely finished and also is a great way of getting that sub seconds on a very thin dress watch. Moving right along, you also have to look at Unitas. So these are kind of these traditional old beat frequency pocket watch style movements. And similar to the ETA 7001, the Unitas family of calibers are highly regarded manual movements that are larger and appear like, again, classic pocket watch movements. This as a result is gonna make them much larger in diameter. And when you flip them over, it does create a very interesting dynamic with the case versus the movement in terms of its size. Now these movements tend to be on full display in the watches that they inhabit, really as a byproduct of their elevated looks. Now the Unitas family of movements are most commonly found in oversized dress watches, as well as traditional Flieger style pieces from brands like Laco and Stova. And then one final manual caliber from ETA to definitely look at is the ETA 28012. So in terms of dimensions, they have a nice middle ground of their diameter as well as their thickness. Also, will have a nice power reserve, but most importantly, here they're going to be featuring hacking and, of course, hand winding with a hand wound movement here, but a beat frequency of 28,800 vibrations per hour or 4 hertz. And from a visual standpoint, also follow suit with the more traditional three handset at the center rather than the sub seconds that you'll find with the, say, the Pazoo 7001. So I think we're all aware of the challenges that go with developing an in-house caliber and how that's even more of an issue when going for an in-house chronograph movement. And that is really why this next move we're gonna be looking at, the Valju 7750 family of movements, is so widely used. Chances are if you're seeing a vertical register display on a chronograph that is say under $5,000, chances are, it is going to be a Valju family of movements, the 7750 most likely with that vertical display. So these movements have been around for quite a bit of time since 1973. They're of course going to be tested in the marketplace, have been proven over the decades that they've been out there. And also any watchmaker is going to be able to service them. They're reliable, but they do have their downsides as well. They're not maybe the, the best looking movements, but probably most importantly, they are thick. So these are coming in right around eight millimeters in thickness. And this was kind of what I was getting at earlier when I talked about, think about how the movement could so much affect the case. When somebody uses a Valjoux movement, 
and you're using eight millimeters just to house that automatic chronograph caliber, think about how that's going to limit the actual casing and the watch itself. So that's why you're gonna see many watches out there that house these movements being more between 13 and a half to say 15 millimeters in their overall thickness. In addition, the rotor jiggle on these are commonly uh, called out quite frequently. Many people have never experienced a value before, might feel the thing shaking on the wrist with that rotor just rotating around as fast as possible and might be a little scared that something could loosen their movement. That is just typical with these. But these are very reliable movements. They're well tested in the marketplace and are definitely the go-to option in say under $5,000 for going for a chronograph. In addition, there's a reason why brands from Tissot to IWC, Hamilton, Zinn, Tag Heuer, Breitling, Omega, Panerai, and many others will vest their faith into these workhorse chronograph calibers. But now that we looked at the Valju, then moving into traditional three hand movements, and there probably isn't going to be any other Swiss movement that is going to top this one in terms of popularity and just being ubiquitous in the marketplace, and that is the ETA 2824. Now, in production since 1982, the ETA 2824 II is perhaps the most commonly seen third-party automatic movement in Swiss watches today. Seen in watches with prices anywhere between, say, right around $1,000 and a little bit below to somewhere around two to three grand. They're available in four grades with varying amounts of jewels, with use of different materials and levels of accuracy, all the way up to cost certification levels. The 2824 is considered by many as the industry's greatest workhorse automatic caliber. Virtually anybody can service it, and they're generally regarded as excellent, if unsexy, calibers for tool style and everyday watches. In addition to the standard ETA 282 being a three-hander with a date, there are also countless other variations, including the very popular Day Date 2836 and the 2834. And perhaps the only drawback of the 2824 is that they can be hard to get as a result of the aforementioned ETA swatch group supply reluctance. But since the patent on these have long since expired, you're going to see a ton of different variations out there from other manufacturers that basically do the same job, which we'll get to right after we mention the ETA 2892A2. So positioned as the higher end, more refined alternative to the ETA 2824-2, ETA's 2892A2 in production since 1980 is also thinner compared to the 2824 around a millimeter, meaning it's a nice option for slimmer, dressier watches. Other than the slimmer build, the level of finishing on this movement is generally a bit higher compared to the 2824, and the caliber, again, is available in multiple different grades with different stated variations in terms of accuracy, as well as other upgrades in terms of materials and jewels as you go up. Given its more luxurious positioning, it's also been used as a base caliber for many brands in the past, like IWC, Breitling, and Omega, as well as many countless others. This caliber is often seen with added modular GMT complications, allowing for independently adjusting a 24 hour hand. And then also with the very popular as well, at a 2894, which will have an integrated chronograph module built on top of it as a nice alternative to the integrated system with the Valju 7750. Now, Eta is probably the most established name in the world of third party movements by far. But in the last several years, there certainly has been quite a bit of ground that has been caught up by the other manufacturers to follow here, primarily Salida as probably the second in charge and developing some fantastic movements for the money as well and great alternatives to the movements that we just listed before here. Now, Salida was founded in 1950 and again, has stepped up massively since the early 2000s when the brand began to produce their own alternatives to ETA movements like the ETA 2824-2. Today, Salida is a major player in alternative to ETA for many micro brands and independents looking to avoid the sometimes sudden cutoff of supply from ETA in regards to their movements. It's also important to drive the point home here that Salida calibers are in large part pretty much literal copies of ETA calibers except for say the added jewel and the SW200. But from an operation standpoint, much of the design, the architecture is going to of course be the same. Yet Salida, from my own personal experience, owning several Salida movements in my watches, as well as handling hundreds and hundreds of them, have always been very impressed with the movements. And again, they've just really gained ground as of late. So the traditional Salida movement that you're gonna be seeing probably most commonly is the SW200. For all practical purposes, the SW200 is the direct equivalent to Eta's 282042 with similar specs, capabilities, reliability, and even a similar range of grades available. Salida is simply making use of its vast experience with ETA calibers having been a third party assembler for ETA since 1950 and taking advantage of the fact that many patents directly protecting many ETA calibers have long expired. 
Moving up, you then have the SW300. So with this movement, this is going to be the equivalent to the ETA 2892A2 with a near exact level of spec and also with similar module variations with the GMT SW330 or the small seconds SW360. And as a 2892A2 alternative, the SW300 provides a slimmer, slightly more refined option for watch cases at higher price points. Now, another up and comer that filled the void here by ETA is going to be Soprod, originally founded back in 1966 which today lives underneath the Festina Group family of companies. Like Salita, Soprod was an assembler often utilized by ETA and therefore was easily able to step into the world of producing their own movements as well. While certainly less established in the third-party movement supply compared to Salita, Soprod operates under a similar model, producing calibers intended to compete directly with particular ETA calibers, though the majority of Soprod's efforts are not direct clones, but rather different movements designed to fit interchangeably with ETA or Salita calibers, both in terms of dimension and also the location of dial feet, making Soprod calibers another interesting alternative out there on the third-party market. Of course, brand equity is a bit of question since there simply aren't as many Soprod calibers out there yet, but initial experience out there in the market seems positive. This was housed within uh, some different micro brand watches as of late. You're just seeing it more and more as time goes on. So the most common one you're gonna probably see is going to be the Soprod A10. And this was designed as a drop-in competitor to Eta's 2892 family of calibers and had identical specs in terms of dimensions, though it is not exactly the same movement mechanically. There is a bit of an interesting story about this movement with the connection from Seiko with their short-lived 4L series of calibers. Some say Soprod licensed the design design from Seiko who originally conceived it, but info on this is not incredibly definitive, so it is a little bit harder to make a strong claim here. In any case, the A10 is a solid third-party option, often included in the same types of slimmer, more upmarket watches that you might see with Eta's 2892A2 or Salita's SW300. And one other Soprod caliber to mention and be aware of is the C125, which is being found in more and more micro brand watches, primarily because of its GMT complication. I saw it recently in a review I did of the Baltic Aquascaf GMT. And although there isn't a ton of information about this particular caliber out there compared to say Salita's or some Eta calibers, it's not a surprise why this one has been so widely regarded and starting to be used more and more by adding that GMT on top of that A10 base and adding only about 0.5 millimeters to the overall thickness at usually pretty reasonable prices from what I'm hearing. There's a lot of reason why I think people are looking in the direction of Soprod now. So I did just mention Soprod, but probably third in line in terms of popularity from Swiss manufacturers of movements is going to be STP. So that's Swiss Technology Production. They were founded in 2006 and are currently housed underneath the Fossil Group umbrella as their movement manufacturer. So you're gonna be seeing them mostly in brands like a Zodiac uh, being the main movements inside of those. But as of late, you're seeing it a bit more being housed within different micro brands. And how they came onto the scene was mostly through the really kind of standardized production model uh, in regards to really automating a lot of their process and allowing many of their movements to be, of course, equivalents to the ETA and Salita counterparts. The most popular movement, as well as the brand's equivalent to the ETA caliber family, the ETA 28242, is going to be the STP 111. While the standard 111 is capable of being regulated to within chronometer specs, it also could be purchased with the 313 variant with an official cost certification and that higher grade. Now, STP doesn't have the same brand cachet as, say, a ETA or a Salita, but they are quickly gaining ground, and so far, a lot of the feedback and experience with them on the market seems to be overall quite positive, but don't think maybe to the same degree in popularity that you'll find with, again, ETA and Salita. Now, one final manufacturer that is very important for us to look at as you might be confronted with it quite frequently, it's not always man uh, marketed maybe front and center, but it is happening quite often, and that is modular systems on base calibers that we already talked about. And that is most likely going to be developed by a very highly regarded manufacturer in Dubois de Praz. Dubois de Praz does not specialize in producing complete movements, but rather modular systems. Because of the added expense and complexity inherent in designing new movements with complications like a chronograph, GMT, or calendar mechanisms, many brands will look towards Dubois de Praz's collection of modules, which are essentially add-on designs to fit popular off-the-shelf movements from many more affordable offerings, such as the popular ETA 2894 as well as being seen in even in-house calibers from brands like Audemars Piguet, 
Breitling, Gerard Perigo, and even Richard Mill. Of course, these modules will make for a thicker movement compared to the base, but this way you can start with a tried and tested base caliber and change its capabilities without all the expense in R&D and other issues that come with brand new calibers. However, while modular ETA or Solita based calibers might make the initial purchase of watches less expensive, it's important to note many watchmakers have a different process for servicing modular types of movements and might just opt for replacing the entire modular system rather than actually servicing the movement from the ground up. And this sometimes can lead to some more expensive servicing or maybe not the most uh, straightforward servicing compared to say a traditional integrated movement. Probably the best example of this is gonna be with chronograph systems with the ETA 2894 that you'll find in sometimes entry level mechanical chronographs, but then instead you can spend a little bit more money and get a Valju 7750. Now there are positives and negatives going both route. The modular system is typically a little bit thinner. You're gonna be working off that at a base. Then you have the Valju, which of course we talked about, which is gonna be thicker and have its own restraints in regards to the movement. But in regards to the complexity of the service and what watchmakers typically, from what I've had in my discussions with them, what they prefer to do is go for the integrated Valju movement rather than these uh, modular systems, which can just add a little bit more complexity and also access to parts and making sure that it could be a very simple and streamlined servicing process. Also, another manufacturer just to mention here at the end, just briefly is Kinesi. So this is essentially the outsourced arm of say Tudor as well as Chanel. They have a partial ownership in this manufacturing house and they've been starting to even develop their own third party movements. So the say independent micro brand Norcane is actually housing a Kinesi caliber within them. So that'll be interesting to monitor. And I would imagine that there's gonna perhaps be even more that are gonna get into the mix. And maybe you will also see some independence uh, starting to get into this world as well uh, into the development of manufacturer calibers that other brands could use in house. And one final point that I didn't really talk about throughout this video, but it's so important. And when you're talking Talking about the in-house versus third-party conversation, servicing is very important. And all of these movements on here in regards to these integrated movements from ETA, also the more affordable stuff from Miyota as well as Seiko, they either can be very easy to purchase on their own from those Japanese manufacturers, or you can just slap a new one in there from like Miyota if you wanna just uh, give your watch new life once it becomes time to service. And then you also have with ETA, pretty much any watchmaker will be able to service those. In terms of service intervals, uh, you'll hear a lot of different things out there. I did a whole Q&A with a watchmaker, Carson. Uh, you know, he, he's actually certified to service many Swatch Group brands as well as Richemont Group brands. And we talked a lot about this modular system versus uh, traditional integrated movements as well as service intervals. So if you want actually from a watchmaker uh, type of question Q&A, uh, definitely check that out. I'll link to it in the description, but there's a lot of different thoughts. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to how you're going to wear it. Who is the manufacturer that is going to be housing up that movement, regulating it. But all in all, all the movements that were mentioned in this video are going to be very solid ones. And I think there's a lot of reasons to go look out at third-party movements. And hopefully this will be helpful as you go and look at your next watch and understanding a little bit more what's underneath the hood. All right, guys, well, this was a ton of work to put together. So I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. That is a great way to help out the channel. Also subscribe if you're new here. And of course, hit that bell icon so you can stay up to date with the content. Also, teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands. If you're looking for a new watch, no better place to go. Quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, full factory warranty. So if something goes wrong, you're not having to even pay, worry about service costs. You are completely covered in that regard during that uh, warranty window, which are gonna be multi-year for many of the brands that we carry. Also offer price match. So if you see one of our watches at another authorized dealer for cheaper, fill out the form on the product page and we'll give you a call. And finally, again, nine out of every $10 that we generate goes right back in this content that we're creating. Also to stay up with some more content, you can follow us on Instagram, as well as check out the second review channel where we're going to be posting about three to seven more videos a week. So it's a great way to just get more watch content coming your way every single week. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.